Welcome to the Corporate Digital Marketing Podcast, where we examine the latest digital strategies, tactics, case studies, and technologies to help you drive your brand and your career to new heights. You'll hear from a range of marketers and industry experts to help you, the corporate marketer, to take advantage of your many digital opportunities. Here's your host, digital marketing expert, published author, and regular media presenter, Peter Applebaum. Welcome everyone to episode five of the Corporate Digital Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Applebaum, and we have a couple of firsts today. First, number one, if that makes sense, is that we are actually recording live in the Corporate Digital Marketing Podcast studio. So our guest has kindly come into the studio and we'll talk about Adele a lot more in a little bit of time. But the second first is that we are welcoming a co-host. Enough of this, uh, this just hearing from me. We've heard the overwhelming thoughts that it's like enough of just me. We want some interesting people. So we've invited our director of digital strategy, Susan Workner, to join me on the podcast. And Susan works with us, but she also has her own company and works in the investor relations and corporate communication space. And probably much more relevant to what we're talking about today is the fact that Susan has uh, certainly is a pioneer in in her industry in the corp comms and the investor relations space in developing proprietary software so we're going to be speaking to the marketing director of a SaaS software model so I think it's very relevant so Susan welcome Thank you, Peter. I'm very happy to be on the show. What a wonderful opportunity. I'm very pleased to also be here when Adele is here. I've seen her career over the last few years and I think she's landed a wonderful uh, role as CMO. So it will be interesting to hear her experience. It certainly will be. So without further ado, uh, we are looking forward to having a fantastic chat with Adele. So we will come back and speak to Adele. I would like to welcome Adele Bernard, who's the Marketing Director APAC for Lithium Technologies. Adele, welcome. Thanks very much, Peter, and really excited to to be here. As we are too. So, Adele, if you could tell us a little bit about your very, very impressive background that has brought you to to Lithium and brought us to the, the studios here today. Oh, great. Thanks, Peter. Well, just very quickly, I actually graduated from UTS here in Sydney on George Street. And my first role was in office systems, which was the the early days of tech. So I like to think of myself as a bit of a a tech chick pioneer. A tech chick, is that uh, politically correct? (laughs) (laughs) From office systems, I graduated into IT and, and high tech. And then about 15 years ago, I did my first startup at a company called WebSense. And I was on the original startup team A lot of the challenges of startups is high growth. That's when I first started really getting down and into the depths of digital marketing and how to grow a company exponentially. So I've done a couple of startups. They grew, they got acquired. I looked for other startups. They grew, got acquired. And now I'm at Lithium, which is a digital engagement platform as the APAC marketing director. Okay, fantastic. So... It's interesting that you've actually been doing digital marketing for the last 15 years or so. You'd be one of the pioneers in that space in Australia. Uh, Do you find that digital marketing is central to the success you've enjoyed in previous organisations and also Lithium? Yes, I I find digital is one of the, the key marketing strategies for marketeers. One of my challenges with startups is how do I cover such a broad depth of geography? And some of the startups that I've been doing, I'd have to cover about 16 countries. So yes, you can definitely do offline events, but to get the kind of coverage and the kind of key growth and, and hit my key KPIs as, as you're given from head office in Silicon Valley, digital has been the, the real key and the heart of what I do with the, the marketing strategy. So that, that kind of brings the question, I guess, to, well, with a digital strategy, where do you start? So looking at where you start, obviously, it's at the top of the funnel. So how are you going to bring the traffic to the top of the funnel? And and nowadays, um, you know, I speak to many marketeers and they're going, Google, just put the whole spend into Google. And I question that. Is, is that the right thing to do? Is that really where you're going to get some really good pipeline, high performing leads? Or do you put your spend more into a digital strategy and content? And really, as, as the cliche is, content is king. 
And when you look at the way, you know, Google works and search marketing works, most of the content for search engines should be in HTML. If you put it into non-text content, it's often ignored or devalued by search engines. And um, so th the easiest way for the search engines to find key content is through the text and, and the written word is also very easily displayed to your visitors or to the traffic. So in other words, if, if I could sort of uh, articulate what I'm trying to say with the digital strategy is have a lot of content in your website because then the search engines have a lot to take in. Does that mean, Adele, with your company Lithium um, being a SaaS model, how, how do you find most of your customers then? Are they mostly online or are you still using traditional methods to gain customers for Lithium? That's a really good question. So um, Lithium has a B2B model. So uh, we work with very large businesses. And the way that we get our brand across and the way that we engage in customer acquisition, social acquisition, we, we actually use our own platform. So we have a community and we also use our, our social media tools also to acquire customers. And one of the things I do every day when I look in my inbox, I get a report and, and I use a lot of analytic reports to identify who my key targets are and what, how the pipeline's performing, what's a high performing pipeline or, or target, what's not converting. Um, so looking at reports of who's hitting our website and then from there we can get with Lithium a 360 degree view of our customer. Um, and what I mean by that is Lithium actually bought clout which I'm, I'm sure you know, that's the, that's the social media influence score. So with cloud, not, not only can we recognize who's hitting our website, who's responding to our campaigns, we can get a really good view of that customer, what their likes are, what their interests are. For example, do they like tennis? Do they like Bon Jovi? So getting that 360 degree view is what you can do in digital where you can't really do that. You go to a conference, you go to an event, you get someone's business card, that's great, but are they really a lead? Are they qualified for a, a marketing lead that you would hand over to sales? Well, it's questionable because you don't really have that 360 degree view of who they actually are and what they're looking for. So there's a marketer listening to this podcast. The boss has come to them and said, okay, time to do something digital. We think digital is the future. We've seen all that, we've been to the conferences, we've read all the reports, we've got to do something digital. You're a sophisticated corporate digital marketer. What advice would you give to that person who's saying, that's all great, Adele, but that sounds a really sophisticated, high-end type of things to do. So what are the, the simple things that I, starting off on my digital marketing journey, what can I do from a, an iterative process to, to lay those foundations for the organization? Well, basically, going back to the principles of the buyer's journey, Let's take a look at how does the buyer find a brand? Basically, they do most of their research online before they even contact that brand. Do you have insights to back that up, research to back that up? Yes. Yes. In fact, the statistics are between 63% and 70% of customers actually research what they're going to buy online before they even contact the brand. So, for example, if you're searching for a new telco plan, you don't rush into a, a telco, you don't rush into Telstra or Optus's retail store. You're going to go online, you're going to research all the telco plans, what suits your lifestyle, what suits your budget, and then you go and contact Telstra, Optus, Vodafone, you know, who, whoever that telco is. In your space, as you mentioned, it's a B2B model. You, I imagine you have a lot of competitors in that space. How sophisticated is the marketing of your competitors? It's very, very sophisticated in the B2B space. As you can imagine, um, I, I actually did some research. How many marketing tools are there available for B2B marketers such as myself? The results were there's over 6,000 marketing technology models, software tools available for marketeers 6, today. 6,000? Over 6,000. Wow. So where do you start? That's right. And um, being a B2B in the high tech space, my competitors are also B2B in the high tech space. So not only are we living and breathing 
because that's what we're marketing. Also, our competitors are also living and breathing their tools. They're also using their their tools platform to also market their product and, and do customer acquisition. So it's an incredibly noisy space. The market has developed, I'd say, in the last five years. It's absolutely amazing the kind of tools and platforms that marketeers have. And it's become a real science. I mean, we've really moved on, you know, from the Mad Men days where it was all about telephones, telemarketing, telexes, put an ad in the financial review and hope and pray someone's going to look at your ad. Those days are gone. It's a a very sophisticated, high-tech world. And keeping up with all the changes that are happening and all the the MarTech stacks that are available is also part of the challenge of a a B2B marketeer today. And how do you find the budgets of your competitors? Are they larger than maybe Lithium's budgets, marketing budget? You know, Susan, I've never been threatened by the size of a budget because it really depends on a, a couple of things. It depends on what you do with the budget and how engaged you are, what your brand ambassadors are. What's great at Lithium is we have really cool customers who have really cool stories to tell about what they're doing with our software platform. And yes, we do compete in a very noisy space and we do compete with a lot of high-tech companies that have very large budgets. But I've worked a lot in the high-tech space and I don't think I've worked at a company that have such passionate customers that are actual brand advocates of lithium. And the key to digital marketing nowadays is that peer-to-peer conversation, that peer-to-peer content that's written on websites, blogs, forums. And if you can get your customers super engaged in what you do and talking about what you do, you don't need a large marketing budget. So that's why I say at Lithium, it doesn't really matter the size of the budget. At the end of the day, it, it does boil down to who are your brand ad- ambassadors? Who are your brand advocates? And are your customers really engaged? I think one of the challenges with uh, with a lot of brands, though, is they're not high tech. They're not SaaS models. There's not, there's not a great deal of sexiness factor. For example, let's say I'm marketing nails in a hardware store and the, the main channel is hardware. Uh, if I was that marketer, I'd say, well, that's great for you, Adele. You've got a really online play. You've got a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of really cool, clever people that are associated with it. And even your customers are really up to date with what the latest digital marketing techniques are. I'm, t- I'm marketing to Joe and Jane public who's not that interested. They'll, they'll look at their phone occasionally, but hardly go online. What would you say to someone like that as to what their opportunities are? Peter, you can make nails look sexy. Oh, Adele, tell me more where, <laughs> where all is. In fact, we, we actually have a customer. I just recently heard this story about a customer in Spain, and it's all about home hardware and home improvements. So to your point, you know, hammers, nails, how do you make that really exciting and get brand advocates and brand ad- ambassadors right, out right. of nails? How do you do that? So what our customer did Oh, good, you have the answer because I don't. (laughs) (laughs) I do. I I have it. That's why you're here. (laughs) (laughs) So what our customer did was they built a community. And the community was all about the the how-to. They encouraged all their customers and they rewarded them. So with gamification, they rewarded the content to send in stories, send in um, Snapchat, send in videos, photos of all the cool stuff that they're doing with their home improvements. Then they went one step further than that from the community. They actually took it offline. So the original concept was digital, to be online in the community and share all the tips and tricks and advice. The whole concept grew that they they took it offline and they had meetup. They had uh, in-store demonstrations. So they had their customers coming in and doing in-store demonstrations. But I think the real key to the success of the whole strategy of you know, making all the, the home handy tips and tricks looking sexy was having photos of all the cool renovations and Fantastic. all the cool stuff that they did. And uh, so this particular customer, which is Leroy Merlin, for, for those that know the Spanish hardware store, have been quite successful getting brand ambassadors of their brand to talk about Leroy Merlin. Can I ask, uh, for those marketers out there that might not be as digital savvy as yourself, Adele, uh, what do you mean by gamification? How does that work in the context of this case study? Well, gamification is something that um, lithium 
I must say, is really good at. We we actually have a, a chief scientist officer called Dr. Wu that is one of the leading thought leaders of gamification. He's written books on the science of social. But um, a, a very high-level view of what gamification is is basically rewarding a customer for content. So how do you do that? And we have customers that reward their the content with, say, for example, uh, movie tickets. Another example of gamification is giving your content writers that are writing the content in the communities and blogging in the forums a, a status and calling them stars or ambassadors. And then people aspire to be an ambassador or people will aspire to be a star. So they'll write more content. In fact, we, we have um, a, a customer in Melbourne where on their community, this guy is so passionate about electricity and power and energy. He spends 30 hours a week just contributing on the energy levels of fridges, for example. So in a way, the, the, the product or service is incidental if you have this type of mindset. It's incident. It's the strategy right. of how you use the community. That's the real key. And we have a, a network of people that can help. Once you actually employ the community, that's the first stage. The next stage is making that community successful, whether it's through gamification, rewards, um, strategy. What what exactly do you want to do with that community? So, um, Or isn't it more to the point, what does the community want to do with you? And you need to give them incentives and... and uh, reasons to engage with you, but more importantly, the other members of the community. That also is, is a, a strategy of the community. So, for example, crowds, crowdsourcing right. ideas and using the community to crowdsource new products, new innovations that keep customers, keep coming back to your brand and becoming more engaged and, and sticky with the brand. We talked before about your market and you've got a lot of high-tech and well-funded competitors. Um, do you find that your customers and prospects are more digital savvy than the than most other customers? I know you've, you've worked in the high-tech space for most of your career, but given the sophistication I'm sure most of your customers and prospects have, do you find that a, a, a greater challenge? The world is definitely going digital. Whether we like it or not, we all have mobile phones, so we're getting more high tech and more savvy as consumers. But not only that, consumers nowadays have really extreme expectations from the brand. And that's because we're getting these really disruptive brands out there. So for example, Uber has completely disrupted the way that we expect service to be. We expect to know where a service is being delivered instantly on the telephone. So our, that's pushing more for the the rise in customer expectation. So as our consumers get more sophisticated, so should the brand in the way that they engage. And definitely the way the brands are engaging and, and the trends that I'm seeing nowadays is through social media and being able to respond socially. Because let's face it, who wants to be on the telephone waiting and waiting for that customer agent to take the call? Nowadays, people just want to go on Google and just search what the problem is and go bang straight to the answer and, and bypass the telephone. So with that then Adele, what are some of the digital strategies or programs that you found have had the greatest impact and delivered the best results for, uh, for companies? So taking the principle of that consumers want to go on Google and search for the content rather than going straight to the brand. Um, one great example that comes to mind is Sephora. Now, Sephora wanted to be the go-to place for beauty. And so they created a community called Beauty Talk. When people are passionate about beauty, they're very, very passionate. So they have a huge community of people from all over the world talking about products. They're not necessarily Sephora customers. They're just people that are passionate about beauty. So some of the questions that are being asked where it becomes and transfers into the, the social acquisition or digital strategy side of the business is, so for example, you know, you want to know what mascara to wear when you're at the gym so it's not running. So you put that into Google and I guarantee 100% smack bang, that'll go into Sephora community. So because of the content that's been written, Sephora's been able to engage with people that aren't customers but once they go into the community and they read what other passionate beauty experts are talking about, they have found that 
they've been able to increase their revenue by two and a half times because of the traffic into the community. But one step further, what Sephora did, which was really clever, is they then analysed who in the community was one of their stars or who is writing a lot of content. And that's when they used to, to your other question, gamification. And so they actually rewarded their brand ambassadors or the, the loyalists with Sephora product, which made them even write even more about Sephora products into the community. And those brand ambassadors they found, they actually bought 10 times more than the average consumer. So uh, a digital strategy works two ways. It increases the traffic to get a conversion into a sale, but then you can build on engagement and brand ambassadors, which increases your revenue exponentially. Well, that actually touches exactly what everyone wants, I guess, from, from social and digital is the return on investment. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of the results and the real ROI that is, um, I guess, a lot of these companies are experiencing with this strategy? There's a, a really strong ROI and as you know as marketers, we're constantly asked to increase you know, the, the cost per lead, get that cost down, get our return on investment down. There, there's so many demands on a marketeer. But by using digital, you can actually socially acquire customers without chipping into the marketing budget. So let me give you an example of a, a customer that did, um, I, I think, a really clever social acquisition. And of course, they, they used lithium social response to do this. And the customer is Optus. There was a lady called Bronwyn Cook. Bronwyn Cook wrote a blog where what she basically did is what we're all faced with today. There's a lot of telco plans out there. What telco plan best suits you? So she sent a tweet out waiting for someone to match. Optus's new multiple device plan. Now, Optus immediately responded because they're out there listening and socially responding to those kind of tweets that are out there. So Optus's response was, Bronwyn, sounds like you're living on a prayer. If you get off the lost highway, I'd be happy to have a chat. Now, Susan and Peter, that might sound a bit weird. It does, Adele. It does sound strange. <laughs> But the reason why the Optus agent wrote that is with the Lithium Profile Plus, which is a 360-degree view of the customer, they were able to see that Bronwyn was a Bon Jovi fan. Mm. So the response that they wrote was living on a prayer, which is a... Which would resonate with her, obviously. It resonated with her. And, of course, needless to say... They converted Bronwyn into a, a customer. So that's just one example of many of our customers that are actually using social for social acquisition. Now, I would listen to that case study, and I think from a commercial point of view, isn't that fabulous? From a consumer point of view, there are going to be some people saying, that is creepy. You, Whilst, obviously, I have information out there in the, the public space that's that's public, obviously, on Twitter, for example, I can we can access that. But it's very Big Brother-esque. Now, what would you say to a consumer or even a company marketing person that would say, "It's a we get it, it's really clever, but it, sa it seems quite intrusive? So the information that was there was all public information. I understand that, but it's, it still seems like it's this amorphous, faceless corporate is accessing my personal information. It's clever what you did, what, what Optus did, but it's like it's, it just seems some people are going to love it. And some people are going to think it's uh, it's just a bit invasive. Yeah. And look, Peter, no doubt there is a fine line between creepiness, pleasure and pain, and, and three hundred <laughs> <laughs> and three hundred and sixty. But what a smart digital marketer will do is mm. get to know their prospect and make them with a personal message and make them feel more engaged with the brand. By this example of using uh, Bon Jovi, that really resonated well. Right. So if you use that information in the correct way, if you use it in the wrong way, so an example, and, and it's gone viral um, in the US, there was a case of um, a particular retail store that sent this woman um, an email promoting baby goods. And her father actually got the email and she was pregnant, but she hadn't told anyone. Now that's creepy. Of that's course. not public information. But having information about someone that um, is used in a, in a way to get them engaged and feel 
um, very personal, then I don't think that's creepy. Let me ask you, this is a, a case study that's been on the news recently with uh, United Airlines taking four passengers, in one case forcibly, off the plane because they wanted to make way for United Airlines employees and was handled terribly. It was it hit the, the social media channels instantly. Let's say you're Delta or you're a competitor to United using the sort of strategies you're talking about. What can you do to, again, address to the fact that where it's not invasive, but it's reactive and doing it in a positive way? We see that you hate United. Come and fly the friendly skies. I assume that's Delta. I'm not sure. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You would, um, if you wanted to take advantage of um, a competitor that a competitor's has misfortune, misfortune yeah. that um, where their customers had very bad customer experience, and let's face it, customer experience is the new marketing weapon. The way around that would be to create a campaign where it's very positive and we treat everyone um, personally like family. You know, you, you wouldn't throw family out of the house. Like we don't forcibly take you off the plane. Fly with us. <laughs> yes, exactly. And do a, a social media campaign around that. Okay, so what are the main challenges that you have in marketing your services? Challenges. How long have we got? Yes, <laughs> the main yes. one. I'm well, sure there's many there's since you have 6,000 competitors, but what are the main <laughs> challenges? Yeah, there's there's always challenges work, working in the corporate works workplace. And I'd have to say, in the last 15 years, I've been working in the startup B2B high tech space. What that means is I've been given a lot of what I call BHAGs. For those that don't know that, that acronym, it's Big, Hairy, Audacious Goals. Yep. We love that. We love that acronym here. <laughs> I love we it We do too. the same, yes. So how do you scale for those BHAGs where head office is increasing, change the goalposts, increasing your targets. Well, digital is definitely the way to go. What I have found personally in the past is when, when head office is asking for, you know, deliver more pipeline, um, they may have acquired a new product, they may have launched a new product, so there's even more products and services to market. Digital is definitely the way to go. So developing content where the, the Google search engine will find those keywords and bring the traffic into your website. And um, personally, as, as I said before, working in startups, I have a very geographically dispersed region that I, I look after. So if I was getting the more uh, pipeline to develop with the same budget, digital is definitely the way I would go. So another question then, since you do work across continents as well and working in, as you said, the high tech area for so many years, how have you found working in a more male oriented industry? We don't see many top, uh, a lot of women are very good at digital marketing, but we don't necessarily, necessarily see them in the top roles all the time. So have you faced any challenges in that area? There's no doubt about that IT is male dominated. I was a tech chick way, way ago. <laughs> yes, we but, like that tech chick. <laughs> but, um, as, as opposed to a text chick. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's never stopped me. All I could say to other marketeers is just follow your passion. And if you're passionate about something, people really work off your energy and your passion. That, that's the best thing too. When, when you leave school, it's really hard to sort of find out what exactly you want to do. I say to a lot of uh, graduates that I personally mentor too is, and it's very cliche, but just follow your passion. So I did follow my passion, which was was marketing. I really enjoyed marketing. I actually fell into IT, but once I was there, it was a male dominated industry. I just kept going with it because I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed what I did. And um, people respect your work more than, you know, if you're your gender. You've uh, been involved in the high-tech IT industry for, for some years, shall we say. Many so, more years than what I want to admit to, of Peter. Of course. <laughs> so let's, let's look forward, Adele. Where, and this is a, the, the final two questions we have we ask all of our guests. And the first one is, where do you see digital marketing will be in five years' time? Five years' time is quite a, a chunk of time. It is. In the digital space? In the absolutely. digital space, I, I would see so many disruptive brands coming along that would actually change the way and the way we look at digital. But if I look at the next even 12 to 18 months, I would say some of the trends that's coming out is definitely AI and, and VR. Which, which means? 
or VR virtual reality and AI is artificial intelligence. Which we've heard a lot about if you if you read all the blogs and all the all, all the things in trade magazines. What does that actually mean? It's, it's like gamification. There's a, lot, there's a lot of jargon. What does it mean to me as the corporate marketer who wants to achieve results now? So if, if we look at our iPhone, we've got Suri, we look at Amazon, we've got Alexa, we're, we're already using it, but we're not calling it right. artificial intelligence. So if we look at a community as such, and looking into the future, definitely content and knowledge base is going to be key to not just the marketing strategy or a digital strategy, the overall corporate strategy. So, um, and, and what I mean by that is when you're looking at artificial intelligence, it has to come from somewhere. Where do you start? If you already have a community, that is the best place to start because there's a lot of knowledge that you can do first call support on. So, for example, if you are, um, and I go back to telcos because they have many customers. If you are a telco with a business model where you have a lot of customers to support, an economy of scale, if you could do um, an automated response to those frequently asked questions that are always coming through that customer service uh, channel, you can actually experience a lot of savings and also a better customer experience for your customers. Obviously, for those complicated questions, you would bring in a customer agent. Um, for for a more complicated question. But if you have a, a very simple question that is asked many times, then there's no reason why using the um, content that's in a community, you can use artificial intelligence to, to answer that. So in a way, you're saying that... Uh the community is going to be enduring, which which co- correlates with the answer I always give when it comes to what's your prediction. It's like, I don't know what the platform is going to be. I, I have no idea if Facebook is going to be bigger than Ben Hur than bigger than it is today. But what I do know is customer relationships will endure. They have to, because that's the only way from the back to the bazaars of Babylon into the future where we're all we're all riding around with chips in our heads and uh, on on space spaceships. Um, that is always going to be the perennial. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So the final question, what are your three tips for corporate marketers looking to achieve digital marketing success? The three tips, Peter, um, would be digital definitely drives conversion. So those madman days are over. Don't uh, rely on offline strategies for conversion of leads. And if you look at the sales funnel or the marketing funnel, at the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel, at the bottom of the funnel, what's driving all the conversion? It definitely is digital. Digital's the way to go. The, the other tip is understand the number of digital touch points of your customers or prospects. So how are your potential customers or where, where is your traffic coming from? Is it coming from the website? Is it coming from Twitter? Is it coming from Facebook? Is it coming from LinkedIn? Are you across all those digital touch points? Do you have a strategy to listen about the conversations that are happening in those digital touch points? And then, I don't know if this is advice or tip, is, and, and this could be even a, a podcast just on this particular comment, which is quite provocative. Brand loyalty, did digital kill it? Mm. Well, did it? Did it, Adele? Did it kill it? <laughs> yes. Yes, it did. And, and the reason why I say that, not, not in all cases, but in the majority of cases, the customer drives the conversation. It used to be the brand could drive the conversation, the brand could drive the image, the brand delivered what your expectation was of that particular product. That's now 360. The customer drives that conversation. The customer talks about the product. Now, there are a few rare cases. For example, Apple. I mean, Apple does drive their brand. And Apple didn't create the phone. Apple didn't create a watch. It just made it sleeker and sexy. And they had a really clever way where they could still control the brand. But outside that, in a few other rare cases, digital killed the brand. So what does that mean for marketeers? You need a strategy where you can get your customers engaged and loyal and become brand ambassadors. 
Thank you, Adele. Well, I think that was wonderful. Great insights. I think for anyone out there working in marketing and certainly in the digital marketing space, I think we've all learned a lot. So thank you for coming into the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And Adele, as I say, the first with uh, with a co-host and with uh, a guest in the studio. Adele, I think there's there's some really key insights that we've had our team here in in the in the studio listening to this interview and have taken a, a raft of notes. So I think uh, thank you so much for contributing your your expertise and in, in your knowledge, which I think is going to be very very valuable for anyone who listens. So thank you again, and we hope to speak to you soon. So there's episode five, and we have to thank Adele Bernard from Lithium Technologies for being with us in the studio and giving us, as I mentioned before, some really interesting insights that uh, I think all marketers at all stages of their career can learn from and and take to take to planning sessions and uh, their agencies and ask them why aren't we doing this what about crowdsourcing what about content how we can really make the content work harder for us and whether you're marketing uh, software as a service offerings or nails or hammers there's so many things you can do and, and building communities I think is central to that as well so in wrapping up, uh, as always, we'll have the show notes with a lot of the links that uh, that Adele spoke to us about. And I would like to particularly thank Susan Workner, our Director of Digital Strategy, who joined us for the very first time today, who did a splendid job. Thank you, Peter. Well, I enjoyed that thoroughly. And I think I certainly learned something myself from the episode, certainly from Adele. Well, I think we all did, which is wonderful. So thank you again for listening. And we will speak to you again with another fascinating guest very soon. Bye-bye. You just listened to the Corporate Digital Marketing Podcast. If you have any suggestions about what you'd like us to talk about in future podcasts, email us at info at tickyes.com. For the transcript, links from this episode and other information, go to www.tickyes.com and click on the podcast link. Have a great digital day.